All right, let's talk about how the presence of others can actually affect your individual behavior. We all know that when you're by yourself, you act a certain way, but when you're with others, you change the way you act. Why is that, and what are some of the factors that drive that? So the phenomena of changing the way you act um, in a way that actually helps you is something called social facilitation. So this is the tendency for people to perform differently in the presence of others versus being alone. Um, I have here as an example a basketball or any type of sporting event where an individual rises to the occasion because they're in an arena where everybody's chanting their name. Um, and, and something as simple as to put it in perspective for you is perhaps, say, just performing or giving a speech or writing an exam even. Being in a room filled with others, just the mere presence of them being there will actually change how you perform. So the mere presence of people are simply present, just there around you, doing similar activities or minding their own business will change the way you act and what you do. Think of the example of going to a grocery store. There's people in the aisles, people all around you, they're not even interacting with you, but just having them there will change the way you act. Now, we know that if you have others in, around you, you tend to perform better on simple or well-rehearsed tasks. So if you're doing something very, very simple, um, let's go back to our sporting analogy, an individual who sits there hour after hour shooting free throws uh, for basketball or in tennis is practicing their serve over and over. The reason they do that over and over is to make that a well-rehearsed or regulated simple task. So for you and me, shooting a free throw might be a little bit more difficult or to serve a ball in tennis might be a little bit more difficult because we don't play eight hours a day and we have to think about it and it's a really, really difficult task. But what you want to happen is that you practice so much that it becomes automatic. Now, once you've done that, if you're in a situation where you're around others, that would be defined as a well-rehearsed or simple task, and you're going to do better because of all the individuals around you. If you're having to think about the task, and it's a more complicated task, having these other people around you will not actually benefit you. Now, um, and like I was just mentioning right here, so social facilitation is diminished if you are doing a more complicated or a brand new task. So think, for example, in this image here, we have an air traffic controller. That's pretty complex. So having others around you in a room aren't, isn't necessarily going to benefit you. It's not going to facilitate uh, your behavior or help you perform. Now, we also know that when you're around other people, one of the ways that you're seeing this benefit is this increased level of arousal. And what that's doing is it's actually allowing you to um, activate and fine-tune your dominant responses. So these, again, are things that are much more automatic. So other factors like fear, distraction, or over-evaluation can impact your performance. So if you're up there speaking and the whole time you're critiquing while you're talking or you're thinking about it before you go up or you're really afraid, things that were normally automatic for you that you're quite quite um, uh, good at doing might get impacted because of the others around you. So that's opposite of facilitation. Okay, so another process to consider is de-individuation. Now, what's happening here is we have a withdrawal. So we say de-individuate, meaning you're withdrawing your individual behavior, uh, and to a, state, a decreased state of self-evaluation. So it's defined as a psychological state of decreased self-evaluation and low sense of responsibility causing disinhibited behavior. So it's a lot of, a lot of words there. Let's, let's break that down. So what we're saying is you actually are putting yourself in a different state of mind that's removing yourself from normal responsibility. And because you're no longer responsible for what you're doing, you end up doing things that are a little bit outside of the norm, uh, maybe a little bit more on the deviant side of things. And this is really common when there's a high degree of arousal and a low sense of responsibility. So in a case where you're really worked up and you might not get in trouble for what you're doing because it might be kind of hard to individually prosecute and find out who did what. So examples uh, like are, are after a sporting event or when you've been drinking and you're at a party and all of a sudden a fight or something breaks out and you decide to maybe get involved. Because it's late, it's dark, there's a lot of people, you've been drinking, you have a lower sense of responsibility and you think that you might not get caught and there's a higher level of arousal, you're worked up. At a sporting event, it's a double-double. So you've been drinking and you're worked up. Your team just won or lost. 
Um, you see this all the time. So the, the, the winner of a championship cup, you think the people are going to be really happy and they are happy, but they're highly aroused, highly activated. They may have been drinking and they're in a large crowd and they start riding. Vice versa, the team loses. They're quite upset. They've been drinking, but they're highly activated. Same thing. So it almost doesn't really matter about the outcome. It's more about the state. Now, um, here are some contributing factors. Group size. If there is a very large crowd, you can get lost in the crowd. Again, you're removing yourself as an individual and you're bleeding into the group. Now, is there a magic number where they say if it's only five people, you won't do it, and if it's eight, you will? There's no real magic number. It's very situational. It kind of depends on the group that you're with and what the social context is. But at the end of the day, what I want you to remember is that the larger the size is, the easier it is to get lost in that crowd. Um, another kind of tool that's used is physical anonymity, and that's when you use things like masks, costumes, and face paint to, again, you're, ch you're removing yourself, your individual self from the scenario because you have a mask on. So you, know, you, you call it the Spider-Man phenomena where you put that on and all of a sudden you're Spider-Man and you can do anything you want. And you can put on a mask and call yourself MCAT man and you're going to ace that MCAT exam. Uh, it's because you've now put on this face and it allows you to think and act in a different way. Again, removing that sense of responsibility and removing that sense of individualization. And the last thing, as I already mentioned, is that arousing activities, drinking, sporting events, large groups and parties, um, protests, these things really get you going, get you amped up, and it makes it a lot easy to disinhibit and do these different things. Um, another great example are some experiments by, done by Zimbardo, and this is a, a, a classic key a prison study. And what he did in the study is he took a group of students, and these are individuals who were not prisoners and not prison guards, but they were put in this prison environment, and they're saying, okay, half of you are going to act like the prison guard, and the other half of you are going to act like the prisoner. And they started watching, and then the social context and this differentiation in terms of roles, and see how people start acting. And all of a sudden, they realized the people that were acting like the prison guards started acting like the prison guards. And, you know, they had the outfits on, the hat, and the beating stick, and they started actually enforcing law and beating and torturing the prisoners because they weren't listening, and the prisoners started acting deviant and started acting like prisoners. Again, they took on a role. It was a situation that was different. They were in a group, and they, they were removing themselves individually from a normal process, and as a result, you see that process of de-individuation. Another example is alcohol. I've mentioned that already a couple of times. And so we should know that alcohol is a disinhibitor and it can allow you to do things that you might not normally do, removes that individuation, that, sorry, removes that individual behavior from the equation and allows you to think outside of the norm. <music>